Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, thank you again for being here. So we've got um, some interesting things to show you, some exciting things, I think. Uh, we have been working very hard. We've been absorbing a lot of information, as you uh, can imagine. We want to present some of our preliminary recommendations to you. There will be a more formal report that will be out within, say, four to five weeks that will be uh, available as well. Um, so without further ado, I want to uh, uh, get started. Um, I want to thank, number one, our sponsor, Historic Annapolis, Inc., for really making all this happen and for bringing us here in conjunction with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and Preservation Maryland. We appreciate the opportunity. As a matter of fact, I would love it if Robert Clark could maybe just address the audience for just a moment. Robert, please. Good evening. We are thrilled to be a partner and a sponsor for this uh, event and for this process. Uh, we have found it to uh, be very compelling to see the people that are here. We're here last night. We're seeing a lot of new faces, and that, that's all good. The panel heard from 55 stakeholders today and dozens of others from comments last night. And lots of these comments were new news to the panelists. That's also all good. We're optimistic this is not another study that's going to sit on another shelf and collect more dust. We have a commitment by many to explore the preservation-based redevelopment concepts and I want to thank Mayor Buckley for letting the entire team camp out here on his site for the last couple of days. I want to thank uh, him personally for partnering with us on this idea, and I want to thank his staff for making our visit here so pleasant. We want to make sure that everybody here and everybody who has an interest in following this uh, can. We're going to post updates on our website, annapolis.org, O-R-G, and when the final report is available, it will be posted there as well. I want to give a final thank you to the ULI staff, Lisa Norris and Danielle Dunlap, uh, Bryce Turner, who has led this exercise, thank you, and to the panel. The panel represents a lot of terrifically smart, successful people in related but varied fields. This is an enormous asset that has been exposed to the city, and I hope we take full advantage. But I'd like to introduce my partner in taking advantage of this, and I'd like to introduce our mayor. I wasn't planning on speaking, but thank you so much. I want to thank Robert Clark and Historic Annapolis for actually thinking of this. This is a great initiative because we all want the same thing. We want a beautiful city to be proud of that is for the people that live here, but that we can show off to the rest of the world. And so when this was 
the Athens of the New World, the cultural centre of America. We used to have galas here, we used to have horse racing, balls, cultural events. They used to say back in the day, what happens in Annapolis stays in Annapolis. Or is that Vegas? <laughs> back then in the... No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm just going to just say thank you all for being here. Thank you for being so passionate about this town. Um, and I want to finish with my favourite Jefferson quote, which is, I prefer the dreams of the future to the history of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Lisa, if you can begin advancing the slides. Uh, first of all, just a brief commercial about ULI. ULI, the Urban Land Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. We believe that um, our mission is really to promote leadership and to really think about the highest and best use of land, the responsible use of land, and uh, it's very important to this organization. We do not lobby. We are a trade industry group of sorts, but we really are multidisciplined. We have a lot of different people, as you'll see here tonight, and we think that gives us a very unique perspective. Um, our ULI Baltimore is one of many district councils in the U.S. and, and abroad. Uh, ULI Washington has done work here in Annapolis before. Washington kind of falls between the two district councils, as we call them. They're not chapters, but district, district councils. I want to thank our leadership, uh, Kim Clark, who's our current council chair, uh, Josh Neiman, who's our chair for mission advancement, Josh Halbadel and Sean Davis, who's actually here tonight. Sean, thank you for being here, who is our governance chair. Um, and Lisa and Danielle, as Robert pointed out, thanks for, for their hard work. So I want to introduce the panel, and I'm actually going to start um, over here and let each of them uh, briefly say their affiliation. Rob? Hi, my name is Rob Sloop. I'm with Moffitt Nickel, and I'm a waterfront, marina, and resiliency design engineer. From California, actually. You traveled the first. From California. <laughs> but I have family roots here at Jones Marina. But he wears no socks like an Annapolitan. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Mays. I'm vice president and senior counsel at the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Washington, D.C. Good evening. My name is Tracy Ward, and I'm the executive director of the Easton Economic Development Corporation of Easton, Maryland. Good evening. I'm Eric Evans. I am a uh, community economic development consultant in Baltimore. Thank you. Hello. I'm Paul Sturm. I'm an urban affairs consultant based in Baltimore. Hi, I'm Ed Myers with Kittleson and Associates, uh, Traffic and Transportation Planning uh, from Baltimore. I am Rodney Little. Um, I lived in the historic district for about 25 years, uh, and I'm the former Maryland State Historic Preservation Officer and Director of the Maryland Historical Trust. I'm Bryce Turner, BCT Architects, uh, former chair of ULI Baltimore. Scott Reichel uh, with Mahan Reichel Associates. We're landscape architects and urban planners. I'm Dave Bramble. I'm with MCB Real Estate. We're uh, developers and investors out of Baltimore. Uh, Ian Banks, transportation planner with Nelson Nygaard, based out of our Washington, D.C. office. Hi, I'm Andy Brown. I run a small retail and residential development firm in Bethesda called Stanford Properties. Hi, I'm Aaron Keel. I'm the principal of Enviro Projects. We're an environmental consulting firm uh, located in Smyrna Park. Okay. Um, how many of you were here last evening? <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, I'm not sure what everybody's doing tomorrow night, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be here. Um, you know, we, we had on the screen last night probably eight to ten different categories of concerns that we had heard. And um, we added to those last night. The, the, the audience had a lot of good input. And we actually talked about more, I would say, quality of life issues as well that people wanted to make sure we didn't lose track of. And some of those are uh, authenticity, which I think is a very important one, walkability, mobility, it's not just traffic and transit, but mobility, uniqueness, scale, history, 
the magic of the Waterland connection. Somebody put it very well last night, talking about that magic moment when you get to the water's edge, and big picture thinking. So, if just go to the next slide, Lisa, thank you. Um, so we were asked by Historic Annapolis to respond to specific questions, and that's what we've tried to do. And I'm not gonna read them all right now, they're gonna come up, come up again as we provide responses, but they dealt with private-public partnerships and the city assets and how they could be best be leveraged, parking alternatives and technology, flooding adaptation strategies, historic resources and how they can best be protected, how can the, we create more engaging space at City Dock, historic preservation and the sensitive approach that's so very important when considering new alternatives, the harbor master function and how that could possibly change. The Burtis House, of course, and its integration into any new plan. And uh, the balance of the needs of property owners, visitors, and uh, residents and tourists alike. So um, day one, uh, we, we did a walking tour. Michael Dowling did an excellent job of taking us around City Dock. We also took a look at the parking garage here, the Hillman Garage. Um, it, it was a great opportunity uh, to understand a little bit more about the city dock from an architect's perspective and a historic perspective. After that, we came back and we did interviews. We met with 55 different stakeholders here, uh, as I mentioned. And then the open public meeting, of course, uh, last night, where I think we had about 180 people probably in this room. Next. This morning, we met with uh, planning and zoning. We met with parks and recreation and the city manager and the, and the mayor's office to learn more about specific questions that we had and wanted uh, to get some responses to. So I just wanna mention a couple of things from the start. And they're, they're not on a slide that I'm gonna read to you, but they're a couple of very important topics that I think all of you are probably waiting to hear about. And I just wanna jump into a couple of these things because the panel felt very strongly about these things. And first is that the existing building envelope that is around City Dock, we believe is actually adequate. That envelope is uh, sufficient. It can be expanded to some extent. It can, uh, but most importantly, it needs to be improved, drastically refurbished and improved to improve the user experience. It's not the buildings that are so bad. It's what's next to the buildings usually and also the uses. So that's really the first thing I just have to tell you at the top. Um, we're not offering an opinion on proposed new development, but to the extent that there is new development, it should really meet the existing bulk and height requirements, we believe. Parking needs to be managed better with performance um, enhancements and communication of existing parking so that people can access it. There's actually a lot more parking here than I think any of us realize. And um, you're, you're, you're gonna see that as things change in the next five to 10 years, that parking requirements will be reduced. But we hope that the user experience in Annapolis will be increased by being a more pedestrian oriented environment. We think residents and businesses are probably the most important constituents here. And I think we heard that a little bit last night as well. But we also believe that authenticity and what's important to locals is also what tourists want to see. They want to see a unique offering here, and by doing unique types of things and with a sense of authenticity that Annapolis has like no other place in the world, we think it'll be attractive to, to vo both visitors and uh, residents, which is very important, and the, the needs of businesses. So we're going to jump into now the questions that were proposed to us and our responses to these questions. We're going to start with Tracy Ward. Thanks, Bryce. So our first question is uh, the potential investments that the city could consider uh, for under a public-private partnership. So the first thing we did, Eric and I worked on this together, was to really dig into what are the assets that the city has in order to invest. And I'm not going to read all these to you, but um, there's a couple things that we think um, are very hopeful. So one is um, we're going to talk to you tonight about a concept that we have that could 
double your um, maritime revenue. Um, and that would obviously be very appealing. Um, we're also going to talk to you um, a little bit about how you might use your regulatory controls um, in order to raise revenues to pay for things, um, which is a sort of uh, concept that we're working on in Eastern Maryland. Um, and then also uh, another key public space that you already do a fantastic, uh, our key idea is to use your public space for revenue generation, and you're already doing a really great job of that with the boat shows, um, and so you want to obviously protect that into the future. The other thing that we really feel strongly about is the public process and implementation. So a lot of studies have been done. We got an opportunity to review those studies. And um, I think we're interested in how do, you, um, how do you make sure that those studies come off the shelf and get implemented. And so we're recommending some kind of process um, for implementation, which is really, really important, a steering committee a separate organization that is um, authorized, but always through a uh, very strong public-private partnership and extensive involvement with your stakeholders. Um, the developers will want that as well. The more that they know coming into any situation, um, the, the better it is for them. So we recommend that. So next we're going to talk about, um, <coughs> we took the aspect of uh, capital investment, and we broke it down into a few different areas. The first one I'll talk about is the, uh, the infrastructure investments, and that that's has to do with things like flood mitigation, investments in flood control, making it a walkable place, uh, green space, um, recreational area, and, you know, not the least parking. And as a part of that parking <coughs> investment, there should be a comprehensive parking management system. Um, I, as Bryce said, we do feel that you have an amazing asset of parking right, right under your noses that could be made more profitable to the city. Next, there's the cultural investment. And again, not, you know, the top of the list is the, the Burtis House. Um, programming space. This is an amazing asset you have sitting right there that can be culturally programmed to benefit all and to recognize the history of this place. Um, and let's not forget the, uh, the histo history of uh, watermen and crabbers and things like that that also need to be invested in. <coughs> So we also looked at uh, several tools, um, financial tools that cities can use to achieve their goals. Um, some you're familiar with, tax increment financing. I know that you've done this in Annapolis before. Um, grant opportunities is obvious, but m what might not be obvious is the extensive number of grants out there that would actually fund many of the things, if not all of the things, that we've been talking about. Um, the establishment of a business improvement district. It's a model that works very well in terms of managing uh, public spaces, um, downtowns, uh, and definitely achieved through uh, funding through private dollars. Um, pilot, um, I know that you all do that now. We're definitely in favor of you getting more from the state of Maryland um, because of their impact here. Um, and then also, I mentioned earlier about the regulatory. Um, so back to that, in Easton, we're, we've established a base zoning for our waterfront area and then uh, an additional uh, cap zoning. And if the developer wants to exceed, it's already written into the code of what they're able to do in terms of a variance and how much they have to pay for that. And those dollars then are put into a fund and they help pay for the public amenities that the town of Easton wants. And finally, why are we doing all of this? The public benefit. Um, number one on the list is to enhance the authenticity of the Annapolis experience, which you know, begins with an enhancing the experience for the residents and the business owners as well. And that the tourists, uh, that's the reason they come here, because this is an authentic experience. <coughs> Preserve the historic fabric. Um, again, meet the needs of the residents 
and minimize the damage from that real threat, the Chesapeake Bay coming over the wall. Okay, so uh, my, again, my name is Ed Myers, uh, and I'll talk about uh, question two, which is uh, what parking alternatives and transportation technologies, including offsite concepts, should be considered for city dock. And um, Ian Banks and, and I worked on this on this question together. Um, so, f first of all, it's important to understand that you can't think about parking or traffic or bikes or peds in isolation. You have to think about them all holistically, and we uh, we developed a plan related to parking that that looks at all of those all of those modes. Um, so, first of all, the uh, next slide, Lisa. Uh, first of all, the uh, parking management strategies um, is to increase um, increase awareness of parking opportunities by developing uh, an, an Annapolis parking app, uh, a performance-based pricing program that uh, Bryce talked about, and utilize a district-wide parking program so that when, you, when you're, you are at your house and are coming to the city dock or when you're coming from out of town, um, that you can look somewhere to see where parking exists and how much it's gonna cost. Uh, the good news is that uh, many cities have implemented something like this, so it's not, something that you have to create from uh, scratch. Uh, and, and they found it to be very successful and to help with, uh, with parking supply. Um, you also want to engage potential partners for joint development to the extent that makes sense. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of parking supply in the city that I think needs to be tapped into for, for the parking needs. Um, in, in terms of pedestrian strategies, we want to improve the pedestrian environment by uh, implementing um, raised crosswalks to, by realigning some of the intersections near the city dock. Um, and if you think about um, if you think about the existing intersections down by the city dock, there's a lot of asphalt, uh, and uh, I think a lot of that can be converted to uh, better space, uh, better use space that we'll talk about later. Uh, on the bike strategies. Uh, we, we think we want to implement the, the 2011 Bike Master Plan. There was a lot of thought that went into that, um, and we want to provide appropriate connections between the city dock area and there's, there's three different trails in the area. So make sure that you can get from those trails to the city dock in addition to from, uh, from, the, um, from the neighborhoods in the, uh, in, in the city of Annapolis to get here. And in talking to the city today, they're starting to implement some of those things pretty soon. So some of that will be underway, but it's important to keep pushing forward on, on that mode, and we think that's very important. That'll actually help the parking. Um, the transit strategies, um, th this is really important and integral to the parking management because I think we've got to have better, um, better transit to serve the, the outer areas that uh, could be satellite parking, and, and by having more frequent service, having technology such as next bus, uh, technology which tells you when the next bus is gonna come. And there are other technologies like that, but um, have something so that you know that whether the bus is gonna come there in five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or you should just walk. Um, and I think as long as people know that and are aware of it, they can uh, choose accordingly and, and use the outer outer parking areas. Uh, from a, uh, a load sharing strategy, we wanna make sure that we provide parking uh, in and around the city dock area for, for things like loading and unloading. The businesses that are down there really depend on getting uh, service deliveries uh, on, a, on a timely basis. There are also things like Uber and Lyft and, uh, and, and other things, other technologies, uh, if you think about five years ago or 10 years ago, many of these technologies didn't exist. Who knows what's gonna happen, what the impact of autonomous vehicles are gonna be, uh, but all of that stuff is coming. And so what we're saying is if you manage the, the infrastructure that you have better, we think you can offset um, making some of, the, uh, some of the improvements. We also think that it's important to put in this parking management strategy uh, in, in the event that you do have to do something to the Hillman garage next, next to this building, 
if, if people are already used to using satellite parking, it will make the uh, repairs that are made, made to that and the loss of parking easier for, um, for s residents and visitors to the uh, city dock area. Uh, so this, this is a map that shows the traffic strategies area and you can see um, where the circle um, used to be and we, we just showed a, a simple intersection down closer to the city dock. Um, again, we, we were here for two days so we didn't have a lot of time to put into this but it, it just seems like there's, you can reclaim a lot of space uh, that can be used for other purposes to enhance the, the city dock area and still serve the traffic. We, we, we want to serve the traffic, we want to keep parking there, but we think we can do it with less, uh, less asphalt. A little bit later we'll show exactly how the traffic flow works in that area, the recommendation that we Yeah. Hi, I'm Rob, again. Uh, I'm here to talk about flooding adaptation and strategies, uh, particularly as we go forward. So um, we had a brief meeting in review of your, your present plans for the nuisance flooding that's going on on your regular high tide basis on an increasing uh, occur uh, frequency of occurrence. And, and we think that you have a good plan in place uh, to address that. We think that it's critical that you adopt it on both sides of city dock and that you find the funding to do that uh, as, as quickly as, as possible. That would be a fantastic first investment in a public-private partnership. Uh, we think that that's, that's a good system that will maintain you for uh, a, a while, uh, but we, we think you need to be thinking a little bit into the future about what you're going to do uh, as, as sea level uh, comes up, and, and these all fall into a topic of resiliency. So, Right, and we're going to talk about, I think we're going to talk about funding a lot today. Um, so uh, basically, I'm not going to give you a, a, a long-winded lecture on, on general resiliency practices, but the idea is, is to assess your risk uh, and then uh, make every effort you can to reduce the risks that you know about and that you have good science on and that you know are coming. Then, uh, unfortunately, the next step in that is, is you have to endure. You have to, you have to survive uh, the... the event, whether it's a flooding event, a storm event, any other kind of natural disaster, uh, then you need to, uh, in this endurance, it's important to preserve the uh, critical items like utilities, connectivity, uh, transportation, and your, your, your critical emergency services. Uh, then the idea is to recover as quickly as you can. So these are all principles that should be going into a larger scale uh, citywide resiliency program. Uh, those are general. Uh, specifically uh, for this uh, project, we're looking at, oh, it's me that didn't switch. So uh, some of the, you can, you can read these, I'm not going to read them all to you. Uh, one of the things is to develop an adaptive management plan where you're monitoring events uh, and you are, you are forward thinking. One of the important parts of forward thinking for this kind of uh, what call it climate change or sea level rise is to identify funding now, uh, try to put it into a dedicated fund that you know that you can use uh, that when it's going. We don't think there's uh, a panic to do anything more than the nuisance flooding right now, but we do think that you need to plan for it and you need to put the funding away to identify um, and start working with stakeholders and, and design for things like elevating the roads, planning on gradually increasing the seawall height, uh, try to isolate the flooding basins that we have down here into individual basins that can be controlled a little bit better or uh, by even designing some areas where it's okay to flood and diverting waters from areas where it's not okay to flood there as a bit of retention. Um, one of the things we would love to see in the future, I, it's difficult, is to put your utilities underground and harden them for any kind of risk. If not, we'd like to see you uh, have backup systems. Uh, it, a good example for resilient thought is on the pumping systems that you're planning for the nuisance is to incorporate that into some sort of existing building and have the backup generator for those systems also be backup for the buildings or backup for the street lighting or backup for, for critical systems like that. So it is to co-use as many of your resources as you can. And then finally, we think the 
Uh, none of these things are going to happen or happen well unless you have a dedicated uh, resiliency plan and maybe even an office of resiliency or a chief resiliency officer. These are all things that uh, most of the uh, historically fl uh, flood or disaster prone areas in the U.S. are doing, uh, many of them through some of the ULI programs that are available. Thank you. Rodney and I developed these points together um, to answer the question, what ways can historic resources be best protected when new development is planned at City Dock? But I, I want to uh, really emphasize the idea that the points we're making, I think, were shared by the whole team. And you'll see these same concepts woven throughout the other uh, answers to the questions also. So we established principles for each of our questions. And the, the first principle was the city dock is a historic resource in its own right, and any new development should continue the height, scale, and authentic character of Annapolis. In other words, it should not feel distinctly different, and it should, con should continue uh, the existing uh, height, scale, and character. And then we had some specific points under that. Historic view sheds should be preserved and enhanced. As much as possible, uses should reflect local traditions and history. Existing standards on height, bulk, and massing should be retained with some adjustment for new FEMA levels. Um, and any new development should continue to be subject to the review and approval of the Historic Preservation Commission. And lastly, you all have done a lot of work on these resources already. So the cultural landscape study for City Dock and the historic structures report for the Burtis House should continue to provide guidance for changes and new development. So Aaron and I were tasked with addressing the question about how the City Dock can evolve into an engaging space and one that reinforces the visual connection between the water and the land. And we felt that a very important concept here was returning to a really pedestrian-centric space. And we included this image because it was a reminder to us that vehicles didn't know his rule. And, um, and we would like to reconnect people with the harbor. Um, and we have an, a number of ways to do that. And, and the most, um, prob the one that would probably raise eyebrows the most is to limit vehicular access above Craig Street. Um, other than servicing the buildings that exist, okay. Other than servicing <laughs> the existing buildings for loading purposes, you know, you, you, you have a sea of parking there, and it, it did not feel particularly inviting to us. It felt like a barrier to Susan Campbell Park rather than an inviting uh, way to get there. So we'd like to convert and reclaim that Ego Alley parking beyond Craig Street to an interactive space that it's really dominated by the pedestrian that's available for programming. We heard a lot from the arts folks about concerts that they'd put on and dances that they'd put on. And we feel that would be enhanced by, in, in, by enlarging that space and giving it over really exclusively to pedestrians. That said, we do have to find alternative parking for the spaces that are lost. You've heard a lot about parking strategies to, to maximize spaces that already exist. It may be done in concert with an expansion of the garage, the Hillman garage. We recognize that that parking does have to be replaced, at least until parking demand is diminished through whatever technological advances there are in, in self-driving vehicles. Um, we, w we also felt that the walkability of the, the market, the area around uh, the, the market house, could be greatly enhanced. There's a very wide stretch of asphalt between uh, crossing that street from Market House to sort of the, the, the main part of town. And we didn't feel that there needed to be that much asphalt. We, we felt that parallel parking could be introduced there and that um, you could expand the sidewalk and get opportunities for more streetfront dry, uh, dining and that, that that area, again, would be greatly enhanced by reducing <coughs> some of the asphalt. And you'll see that, again, in the more details of the traffic and circulation plan. Relocating the Harbor Master building. We, uh, we spent some time in the, with the Harbor Master and the staff up there. We went up, we watched the operations, um, and we think relocating that function over to the Burtis House makes a lot of sense. And they, um, she and her staff were amenable to that. They'd thought about that. Um, bringing that building down from two stories 
to uh, either a single story which contains public restrooms or is eliminated entirely. We do like the idea of a visitor center there because that's the logical place where our vehicular access would end. And so the tour buses and those cars carrying people who couldn't walk would effectively go to, to Craig Street and turn and drop, drop off the pedestrians. And having the visitor center there, perhaps in a different form, we talked about a visitor center that had mostly glass sides so that you could see through that to the water. Uh, we thought that would be great. Um, so the, the public restrooms can stay there. They can be lo relocated to the Burtis House. We really didn't feel that strongly about that. Finally, we really liked, we enjoyed the Alex Haley Memorial Pocket Park. When we did our walking tour, there were numbers of kids there feeding the dock. We could see how children could learn about the, the tidal movements up and down, and the, it really uh, embraces and encourages people in the park to interact with the water. And so while there could be some enhancements made to that, we think that keeping that park in some form there uh, makes a lot of sense. Question six was, um, what is a historic preservation sensitive approach to new development along City Dock that will ensure protection of prominent view sheds and sight lines to and from the water. The principle that Rodney and I came up with for that was historic view sheds from the land and from the water should be preserved and enhanced. And I wanted to emphasize from the water because we heard that last night and, and everybody on the panel really listened to that and felt that it was an important thing to emphasize. And then the specific points were as much as possible the view down Main Street toward the water should be opened and retained Views from the water to the city of Annapolis should be enhanced and preserved, including retaining the views up to the key landmarks of the State House, the Academy Dome, and St. Anne's Church. A key principle to preserve the views will be to retain the existing height limits, except that the height should, if anything, diminish closer to the water and the Burtis House. And the view to the Burtis House from the water should be retained and enhanced. So uh, question seven is, where could the harbor master function be located uh, to meet the necessary needs of the voters? And uh, I'm going to answer that question via another vehicle. Um, uh, I fully believe that there's an opportunity here to create not just a city dock, but to, to recreate something that looks like a city harbor. Uh, what we've shown here is an expansion of the city harbor, harbor out um, uh, offshore a bit. I'm showing 250 by 350 floating docks. Um, with mega yacht uh, capacity, upgraded power. Uh, right now you have about 1,400 feet of, of leasable slip uh, for the city. Uh, this would bring you 2,300 and it would bring it in at a higher price point. They had ADA access. Uh, a vast majority of this would be eligible for a grant. It, it looks like it would be uh, boat show compatible based on uh, the layouts that I, that I reviewed. Uh, we would have to lose, uh, I'll tell you straight up front, we'd have to lose 11 of the morning balls out there, but I think revenue-wise, you'd rather have uh, one mega yacht than 11 mooring balls in there. I know that the cruisers won't like that. Uh, the other things that this really does for the larger land side plan is this really provides a draw all the way out to the end of the water, and instead of having a dead end, you, you have something to do uh, out there. It increases the foot traffic, and then this would also give us an opportunity to provide uh, more commercial uh, operation out here, whether it's it's day racing sailboats that you could, you know, crew and charter. Or you could bring back some of the even on a uh, uh, a small time basis, uh, some seafood sales. It'd be boutique and it wouldn't be real, but you could unload something to uh, from the boats. So we think there's a tremendous uh, opportunity here. Now, once you've established this as the uh, the focal point of the boating activity here except for the drive-bys that are going by, then it makes sense, uh, even more sense, to relocate the harbor master function out to this end. Uh, we would keep the historic nature of the, of the existing house and rebuild that, but we would add on a secondary element that would have uh, all of the services uh, that you'd expect with a, with a large uh, yacht basin, inc including you know, some, some crew, crew room, um, areas for uh, laundry, um, communications, uh, and those kinds of things. Question eight was, 
Question A was, how can the Burtis House be considered for future use? You've heard a little bit about that already. Future use integration and or relocation within any redevelopment plan for City Dock. The principle was that the Burtis House is the authentic representation of the working history of City Dock and should be retained in place because most of its significance derives from its location. It provides a singular opportunity to provide an authentic experience for present day residents and visitors. And then the specific points were the Burtis House should be retained in its current location, but may be raised if necessary for flood mitigation. The Burtis House should, retain, should remain in a compatible use. You've heard a number of suggestions tonight. Ideally, that use ties to the history and traditions of Annapolis, such as sail training, history, harbor master, or interpretation. And the Burtis House should be rehabilitated under the historic preservation standards informed by the historic structures report that already exists. Uh, so the last question, and I'll go quickly because a, a lot of these things are sort of have been discussed, um, and I'll make sure we have time for questions. But the uh, the last question is: How can redevelopment of City Dock balance the stated needs of property owners, residents, adjacent neighborhoods, and tourists? And I think there's a natural tendency to assume that there's friction there. But as Bryce mentioned at the outset, the reality is that all those interests we think can really be aligned if you think through the revitalization process. Um, it, you know, if you think through it in the right way. Uh, one of the key pieces we think is the designing and programming, and that's sort of dragging people all the way down um, to the end of the uh, end of the city dock there, um, which invites residents and tourists and everybody to sort of explore that far end of the dock and enjoy the, the connection between the water and land. And we think that if we can really, if you can really put some serious energy into the into the programming of the green space and the public space from an entertainment perspective, a cultural perspective, a diversity perspective, um, that that's gonna drag people down. And what that does then is it helps you activate all that retail there that you know you have all the parking but still seems to be suffering. That's because there's no reason for people to come down. It's sort of like, oh, what's down there? There's, you know, there's really nothing, it's a dead end. Um, so we think that the combination as you head down you know, towards the end of the dock there's, a, there's an opportunity to add a community amenity, uh, meaning service retail, which is really designed for the neighborhood, um, which sort of fits that mid-block area. Um, you know, and then as you head out closer to the end of the dock where it becomes more pedestrian, you can add more entertainment, food, and other things that sort of enhance the cultural experience um, and get people saying, hey, I'm gonna go down to the end and see what's going on. Um, you know, and as you're, as we're thinking about this, you have to, you know, we're redesigning the access and the parking, and you'll see some of these, uh, some of these images, uh, so that uh, it, it, it makes sense for people to actually come and use these, these items, and the whole process is enhanced. Um, while we're, while we're doing that, I think it's very important, as Bryce mentioned, to make sure that all of the experiences um, <coughs> uh, reflect the authenticity that that Annapolis, you know, that's special, that's special about Annapolis, um, you know, authentic food, you know, good services, all the stuff that makes this place, you know, a cool place to come and spend time with your family and friends. Um, one of the other things we just w wanted to touch on briefly is that as we're doing this, it doesn't mean that you're not creating new spaces or new uses. There are opportunities for uses that aren't, you know, you know, opportunities for infill development. We thought of things like you know, small hotels, uh, mixed uses with potential residential and office. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously these things would, if you can get those uses, they improve your tax base and create a more attractive opportunity uh, for folks to come and visit and use the space. Thanks, David. <clears throat> uh, next we have, uh, no tap would be complete without some diagrams and planning. Uh, we've tried to do some analysis work, and Scott Reichel is going to walk us through um, some of these next couple of images. So we it, outlined in red, you'll see that's what we're calling the city dock area, and we just wanted to see how that compares with some other large public spaces around the country and close, close by that you might be familiar with, because it really helps you understand it's a, it's a large space, um, and we were excited to see that. 
So this is Battery Park, but you can see, I mean, you can see how much of Battery Park uh, that is in New York if you've ever been there. Um, this is Georgetown's waterfront. You can see it's, it's the same size as a long piece of that. Hunter's Point, also in New York. This is Sandlot, uh, this, the, the brown part to the, to the top. Uh, this is Sandlot, which is a, a temporary uh, food venue and volleyball. It's, it's all sand was brought in. Michael Beatty, who couldn't be here tonight, who's on the panel, actually uh, did that at a project while it's under development. And it's a huge hit. It's a temporary installation. Sorry. <laughs> And then the yards in, in D.C., which you can see uh, if you've been down there, that you, you've got a comparable space. And the National Harbor, uh, you go, going all the way up through the streets of National Harbor, through the center of National Harbor, and then down to the, which is a large space between the restaurants down below. So when we looked at that, we looked at uh, how do we, you know, we tried to break it into districts. Then, you know, we're sort of calling this the Main Street District Market Square. We, you know, when we looked at the circle, we think the circle really just takes up too much space. It's too much of a vehicular-oriented feel. And that why couldn't this be a square that you drive into, like you would drive into a European square, where it's all raised sections and it really becomes your uh, center square. Uh, future infill development. This is a missed opportunity with surface parking lots. We think that a lot could happen over there. There needs to be more of a synergy from side to side. And currently, that doesn't exist. Um, the park space, uh, obviously, we think that it's important that it comes all the way down and catches people from the market and goes all the way out. Um, and how that's realized is, you know, we'll, we can show you an idea, but it's certainly not the idea. And then city dock retail, what this is, is it, is it food and beverage, uh, restaurants, is it uh, what community-based retail, as we mentioned before, and then what we're calling the city harbor, where we'd like to see more sea rays uh, parking. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a joke, it's a joke. <laughs> Gold, chains. Gold chains and sea rays. Uh, we, we listen to everybody. Um, <laughs> But I, I do want to point out that these are floating docks, and, and one of the gentlemen yesterday spoke about how uh, we wanted them to be handicapped accessible for our wounded warriors. So these, these can all, they all would be ha handicapped accessible. They're at the water level. So that this, this now can be that space, uh, and those docks will be at water level. So the boats will be setting down at water level. I, we think that uh, it's better than having them uh, be up permanent elevations. So this is the vehicular circulation. Um, I'm not a traffic engineer, but uh, we explained it a little earlier, is that this would just be, uh, the traffic would really stop at Craig, but then we'd also have loading and bus drop off that could maybe come up here and allows uh, to still service this building. Um, two-way on compromise to Randall. We think that really reads through. The rest of this could be all be raised intersection curbless from uh, really Randall and compromise all the way back uh, to these buildings here. And then uh, it's one way up uh, Main Street and then one way here. So you, you come up, if you, if you come down, you can come in here. This is loading and parallel parking. One of the things we realized, and I think it was mentioned before, that uh, the head-in parking is great, you get more cars, but it really is a suburban solution. It's not something you typically see in an urban core. Uh, and you can get a lot of sidewalk space back uh, for cafe seating, di you know, outdoor dining, pedestrian movement. There's a, you know, as, as I've experienced, you come down here on a busy night, you wait sometimes to get by people on the sidewalk. Um, so uh, pedestrian circulation, I guess, you know, it's, it's very similar. I think what we want to say is that we think this is a real missed opportunity that the promenade 
stops. Uh, it would be nice if that continued all the way around the Marriott and connected. Uh, another big movement is we think that you really need to play up this Craig Street connection into the Barry Gate. The, um, that street is, we think, excessively wide. You could narrow it and, and make the sidewalks on either side much wider so that it's more pedestrian friendly. And then celebrate at the end something that uh, really collects visitors because a lot of people, this is the way they're coming into the city dock area. So things that we thought you know, programming wise, having obviously music festivals, uh, bringing out <laughs> folks to the, to the uh, out to the city dock area. Uh, this is Pierce's Park, which is, is a playground, but it was all done with sculpture. Uh, it's really successful in downtown. It's actually on the pier in downtown Baltimore. Something like this could happen as well. There needs to be more than just uh, lawn and space. We need things for kids to do and uh, come down and blow off a little steam when you're in a tourist area and your parents are uh, taking you around to see all this tourist stuff. Kids want to run around, right? Dancing, we heard the uh, tango dancing, but I think this could be great. There's uh, multiple places for this. You could do it in the Market Square or you could do it out at the point, but uh, why not have music and dancing? Uh, ice rink, this is, a, this is, you know, a big idea, but it, it could, you could do a small ice rink if you wanted to, and there are uh, companies that do this all the time. They come in, they set it up. Uh, you basically, the revenues go back to pay for what they charge you to set the thing up, and they take it down. This is a project of ours in, in uh, D.C., and that's all lawn underneath there, but they come in and set the ice rink up and take it down. So just, this is a plan, and it's really just a diagram. It, it's basically taking that diagram one step further. <laughs> and, the, um, and so some of the things I'll just point out that we, we really felt strongly about was taking the, um, we think that the walls uh, currently, this isn't even working anymore. The walls are currently that are around the bulkhead. We'd like to push them back. Uh, here you go, right in. So we think that if we lowered this whole area, we kept that lower, let that periodically get inundated. Uh, what what type of landscaping this is? Is it you know is it natural landscapes that that take you know, is bay landscaping that'll take periodic inundation? Is it uh, demonstration areas like this could be, this could be lawn that just gets inundated, but then you create sort of to get that bulkhead back up, you create a step system that goes back up, sort of an amphitheater. So all, uh, people can sit here and look out and enjoy the harbor. Right now, when you lo walk along the bulkhead, you're so, the bulkhead's so high next to you that you, you kind of feel disconnected from the water. Um, so this is the possibility of, of stepping this down, and the wall would basically come around and connect to this building here. Um, we also said in this square that this, we're showing this as blue as potentially maybe it's a uh, as Roy showed yesterday, the pond, we, we think that that could be, uh, you know, a shallow little place that kids could do a regatta sailing, um, like you see in Luxembourg Park in Paris. Uh, it could also be uh, a horticultural display. It could be this amazing place that uh, several times a year you're putting in this amazing, you know, it's tulips, it's, uh, it's a fall display. It could be, uh, it can it doesn't have to be anything. It could just be paved areas. We did think that uh, expanding the market out with a trellis pavilion so you get shade, that this is an opportunity to do a farmer's market area that would be something you close off the streets in the mornings and this all becomes a pedestrian zone and there's some shaded, shade provided. Uh, and. And that pavilion could be where ban you know, bands could be there. You could have, uh, that could be the dancing underneath there. Um, so these are just, I, these are really placeholders. This could also be, you know, where the holiday displays go. That's where the choirs come and sing Christmas carols and things like that. The, um, uh, there's, there's, a, any, there's a myriad of, of opportunities to do with this space, but we really think that this is. We heard that from many people that this really is your living room 
Uh, it, it's the living room of Annapolis, and you don't really park cars in your living room. And we think that having this edge, we know we need to keep it. We know we need to, uh, it becomes a streetscape back here that is comfortable, it's shaded. Uh, these then suddenly are overlooking the park. We think the value of all these goes up quite a bit um, in that they now are, are bordering a park. And I think just, just to point out, this was where we were saying the um, uh, Harbor Master would be located and potentially the visitor's uh, center. The, uh, as you come in through Barry, we were saying maybe this is an information kiosk that you know, it catches people and they all can, uh, everyone can see where it is, you can point to it. So as I said, I don't, you know, we don't want to call this a, you know, this is really just realizing some of the diagrammatic stuff because a lot of people don't understand bubble diagrams, but it's just a way to sort of articulate that. And we don't mean this to be a plan. We, we take weeks and weeks and weeks to do things like this and get paid money to do it. So this is, <laughs> this is a, this is a 24-hour effort, and, um, but we, we just wanted to give you some illustration, some ideas, so it's things for you to think about. I guess one other thing that, that Michael kept uh, uh, saying was that doing some temporary moves out here, like a sandlot, is a really good thing. It, it's, uh, the park there is sort of falling apart, the bricks all upheaved, the, there's trees there. It's not... It looks a little disheveled, and you could do some temporary moves, see if it works. You do a sandlot kind of a thing. You could do bocce out there. They're very easy to do. They're temporary. If it works and if it draws people out there, maybe you decide to keep it. But doing some temporary moves out in this space could really, you, could, you need to activate this end because currently there is no reason to walk down there to, to just a brick uh, paved space that has great views. You've got views all over Annapolis. You don't need to walk to the end. So I, we, we, you know, Michael just kept saying, you need to activate that, we need to do it, and you can do it tempor with inexpensive temporary solutions as a start. So, so that. Thanks, Scott. Um, Lisa, would, would you just forward through the, the rest of this? We had some programming slides. I just wanted to see oh, there's a what else we had actually there. and. Uh, no, I, I think that's good, and we can just keep just keep going through for a moment. I wanted to see what you had for the last. Okay, all right, that's fine. So this was a, a section view um, indicating the the bulkhead, the water's edge, and the the park, if you will, the opportunity to get some some trees and some elevation there. There is a need for flood uh, mitigation here, and this could be an important place to do that, as Scott said, where you just I'll, you allow it to flood every once in a while because it's going to flood and it's going to flood more. It allows us to uh, possibly raise the street here a little bit higher and that's something that of course has to be studied. If you go back now to the plan, I did just want to mention, and this is really indicating the, the flood wall, if you will, that can be as transparent as possible if it's done skillfully uh, in the way that we just described. It's currently already in place uh, up to the um, uh, reserve fleet building, I guess, there. Um, and if you go back to the, to the other plan, um, just a few things. We know it's controversial to take away parking, and we are taking away some parking. However, I think it's really telling that the best parking that you have anywhere near City Dock is the worst retail. And it's because of the fact no one wants to walk down there. So this would make people really want to walk down through this park space. There is teaser parking here, which is what we call it. There aren't many spaces, but there are spaces on either side of the street. Parallel parking is what we've suggested. This needs to be studied. It could be a, a bay of parking, but my guess is, especially where it's narrow there, you start to really destroy the park, quite frankly, and we think it would be better uh, in this way. As Scott mentioned, an anchor use that could be seasonal in nature at the end could be very educational and allow for some diverse programming, including maybe watermen pulling up and children understanding the, um, the connection to the water that they have. And we heard some great uh, stories from some uh, Eastport residents about how that had happened in the past. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. 
And um, so just a couple of conclusions. Um, one, as I said, we think that City Dock really has enough buildings. Uh, they can be reconfigured, they can be expanded. You could build uh, new buildings within the footprints that you have within the, the, the current uh, bulk and height restrictions, but they need to be much better. And, and what really needs to be better is the area in front of those buildings to make it more engaging and much better user uh, experience. Um, there will be public investment required, no matter what happens down here in, in some form. That may be in the form of the landscaping that we've shown, the streetscaping, for instance. But no matter what happens, and underground parking would be great, but it's incredibly expensive, incredibly expensive here, and I, uh, we, we really don't think it's achievable. Um, we also think that extending the city harbor, the way that Rob mentioned out here, this is a big deal. This could really bring a lot of revenue into the city and could help to pay for some of these other types of things. And this is something where uh, a, a lot of boaters, and especially larger boaters, uh, you know, aren't able to really enjoy Annapolis. And this could be an opportunity. And we want it to be for everyone, but I think to be able to, to bring in larger boats makes a lot of sense for you as a community. Um, lastly, um, I think that one of the other recommendations that Tracy mentioned was a steering committee, you know, that's made up of the mayor's office, city council, property owners, and, and community members that have the authority to really move forward on some of these things and start to really make some things, make some things happen. So in a nutshell, those are our recommendations. We will have more detail in five weeks or so and some refinement of this. Uh, but we'd now like to open it up for questions and comments. Yes, in the back of the room. How does that dock that's extended off of there impact the view shift if you have a 200 foot yacht on the end that's 40 feet high? It's going to go ahead, Ron. So um, we like boats. Uh, and, and we think that um, this is a nautical place and a nautical harbor. Uh, we don't envision that being as a permanent berth. Uh, that is a wave attenuator out there, and those outside berths are likely uh, to be uh, in heavy, uh, heavy wind and heavy seas. So we, we're envisioning that as being temporary, and we're hoping that a uh, ship of state comes in. We're hoping that you can bring in a 200 foot a uh, Coast Guard cutter for display and have people come down to see it uh, uh, for a week or two weeks. And so uh, we do understand uh, that there will be boats in the harbor, but we don't think that your view will be much different than uh, what you're seeing uh, with the moorings out there. These are floating docks. They're very, uh, they're relatively low freeboard. And the sea of piles that you'd have with fixed docks would be there. Uh, there'd, be a, there'd be a lot fewer piles, but you're right, there will be boats in the harbor. I would add that this, this arrangement gives you the opportunity to bring in different types of large vessels, like uh, tall ships, things like that, that are completely conducive with the uh, historic um, colonial harbor uh, view shed. And even the, the photo that we showed earlier, the historical photo, had a, had a pier like this out at the end. So we, we think it's within keeping with the context. Yes. Okay, you'll be next. I'll be quick. I don't have a question. I just want to compliment you. I think this is really exciting and really well thought out. I think some of these ideas are amazing and wonderful. So thank you. I think this is just what we needed. Well done. Thanks. So I have a little ice cream store on the city dock and I couldn't help notice the photograph of the gradient as you look down to the water. Can we pull that back up? The section, the view. Back one. There we yeah. go. So I take it that my ice cream store becomes a basement operation. No, no. That currently, that's the existing street profile. You're lowering the park. 
to well, catch the Well, that makes sense to me that we would control that flooding then, wouldn't we, with that? Uh, well, the seawall's see still there. It's just on, it's by the tree. So the highest spot would be here. And there already is some slope in that parking lot now, of course. But There's that, some what? There's some angle, some slope, some grade uh -huh. there. But the idea would be, and, and look, this is obviously uh, you know, a six-hour <laughs> study, but we think that this can work. The idea is not to change the floor elevation there. Even though the basement would keep your ice cream colder, we don't, that's not what we're proposing. <laughs> this would... Um, well, I'm, I'm would, about 17 inches above mean high water, and we've had the barricade in the door, I don't know, no, I, I understand. so far. So the but idea would be we would allow it to flood up to this point, and again, you know, this needs to be detailed and thought out, but if we can get some type of wall between you and the, and the water, at least up another couple feet, that okay. would be the idea. And All right. And currently, um, when, that, when the harbor floods, it goes straight to the street. There's nowhere for it to go. The concept of putting a, you know, lowered park area to add flood storage capacity won't probably prevent it from getting up in the streets, but it'll help manage it. It'll reduce the time of the street flooding because the water can come here and build up here before it overtops. Well, that's how the city's plan to, to mitigate the flooding, and it looked to me like it was an awesome plan that would take care of about three feet above mean high water um, as we see it now. Yes, so and we're, uh, earlier we said we, that plan is a good plan. They need to stick with it. Okay. This would be an addition, not instead. Well, I guess yeah. th and th the only yeah. other thing, and I'll leave you with this, is <laughs> back in 2010, I have a, a study you guys did. Um, it's back there in my briefcase. And then there was another plan at 2013, and now we have a bunch more changes. I just wondered how much weight was given to the ones previously that you did. We, we looked at it carefully. I mean, we certainly included that okay. in our thinking. Okay. Well, thank you. But Please come to the mic. Thank you. I'm a, also a retailer on City Dock. I have an art gallery there, the Annapolis Marine Art Gallery. We've been there for 40 years. And uh, we're one of the oldest retailers in town. And... My question is, um, what's being done to consider the needs of the different retail establishments on City Dock, business by business by business? If that hasn't been done, uh, that's, I think, important to do. The mayor has visited my gallery, spent 15 minutes there one time. I don't know if you gentlemen or anybody in this uh, assemblage here has visited our gallery, but it, we are our sister gallery of Mystic Seaport. We are important to the area and uh, we expect to be here, but with no parking or with very little parking to uh, service us, I'm just curious, uh, how about uh, some assessment of the, the specific different needs of each of the retailers that are there there's been a lot of change, but we've been there for 40 years. 40? Thank you. Did you say four? Four zero. Four zero, you're right. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Uh, art galleries are exactly what we would like to see there. Um, you know, I would suggest that at any one time, do you have more than five, ten people in, in your store? I mean, it, that's, a, that's a good thing. I think people will find their way there still. We realize we're reducing some of the parking, but there would be parking still right in front of your store. It, it, it will be less, admittedly, in this plan that we're showing, but it's important. I think that's exactly the type of use that we need. If we could get artisans there, so unique types of things like art, um, I think it's a, a really good thing. We need more buyers of art, too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Don't be shy. Roy's shaking we, his head. <laughs> we, we really appreciate um, all of you being here and the input that you've provided as part of this process. Um, obviously, what matters now is going forward and making things happen and, and making changes. And we really believe that some of these ideas about improving the city dock and the parking lot is low-hanging fruit that could really be achieved 
relatively easily. And, and I think we should say thanks to all of you because uh, this is my first tap, but um, from everybody, many other people have been on more, and this is the best attendance that uh, between the stakeholders and the two nights of, of public coming to see what was being done, this is the largest they've seen and any they've participated in. So kudos to you guys. Thank you. Thanks again to Mayor Buckley and Historic Annapolis. We really appreciate it. Bye-bye.